2002, Randy Linden needed a new project. Linden, whose previous work included Bleem, the infamous PlayStation emulator, Dragon's Lair on the Amiga, and of course, Doom on the SNES, is considered a master programmer, a rare breed these days. He understands how hardware works and how to take full advantage of it. He would usually write code in 100% assembly language, squeezing every last bit of performance out of the hardware. But in 2002, he wanted to do something new. And in typical Randy Linden fashion, he would create the impossible. This is an unreleased version of Quake running on the Nintendo Game Boy Advance. No smoke, no mirrors, and no tricks, just Quake. Or more specifically, E1M1, the legendary first level of the game, here in its full glory. If you know E1M1, everything is here. The enemies, the secret rooms, the switches, the armor drops, all of it. As someone who's run this level so many times, I'm immediately familiar with it and nothing feels out of place. This is because Linden would build tools to import Quake levels into his version of the game. The GBA version is quite incredible. It runs at a good frame rate, especially on the 32-bit ARM-based Game Boy Advance. And looking closer, you'll note that the game has correct color palettes and lighting. Walk into a darker area and your weapon will get darker as well. Other than the status bar, everything in this build is fully 3D, even the weapons in the game. Most 3D games on the GBA will use sprites for weapons, but this build cuts no corners. What you're seeing here is an earlier unreleased version of the Quake prototype that was released by Linden in early June. And the story of its development and how it was optimized so well that it could run at this level of performance on the GBA is quite fascinating. The engine itself spans 200,000 lines of 100% ARM assembly language and features no references at all to the id Tech 1 engine that was released by John Carmack as open source. Building custom engines to run games like Doom and Quake is Randy's specialty, and he has very good experience in doing this, especially when we consider his previous work on Doom on the SNES. It's also important to note that Randy was not a Nintendo registered developer at the time, so the Game Boy Advance prototype of Quake began as a homebrew hobbyist project, with the main goal to send the game to id Software and see if they would be interested in publishing the game. This is the exact approach that Linden took when developing Doom on the SNES. He built a small vertical slice, had a friend send the demo to id Software, and of course, the rest is history. The GBA was a popular handheld not only for gamers, but for homebrew developers. The hardware was cheap, easy to develop for, and websites like Licksang.com would sell many Game Boy tools to help developers make games. The GBA ended up being a very open hardware platform, ironic since Nintendo and other hardware makers don't usually share documentation with the public, but it didn't really matter in this instance as the ARM TDMI processor that powers the GBA was very well documented, and this was enough for hobbyists to provide tools to anyone who wanted to make GBA games without the need for an expensive official development kit. To write code, debug, and test, Randy Linden would use a cable that connected his GBA to the PC via parallel port. This was known as an MBV2 cable or multi-boot version 2, but it would also feature connectivity to the PC serial port. And this allowed the developer to perform remote debugging step by step if they choose to do so. As it turns out, a Game Boy Advance and an MBV2 cable performs pretty much the exact same features as a fully fledged Nintendo official development kit for the Game Boy Advance for the fraction of the price. His toolchain was able to flash specific blocks of data rather than the entire contents. Linden would build his Quake engine from scratch. It could pull in Quake maps, convert them to his format that the engine would use, and then run them. And what you're currently seeing here is the earlier unreleased Quake version that took six months to develop from inception to run level E1M1. All things considered, this was a very quick turnaround. However, unfortunately, when his engine was operational, the Game Boy Advance was already in decline in terms of hardware sales. 
So Linden would pivot to development of a prototype that would use non-id software assets to demo as an engine to outside publishers. An updated Quake prototype was recently released by Groot Forest of Illusion and shows off the improvements to the engine. As compared to the original E1M1 prototype, you can see improved animations, point lighting effects, as well as improvements to the camera and water is fully implemented as well. It also features stereo music and sound effects all mixed together on GBA hardware. But unfortunately, this demo was never pitched and sat on Randy's Easy Flash cartridge for years until 2022 when he dumped and released it to the world. So how then does Quake manage to run so well on the GBA? Well, as always, it comes down to clever programming, intimate knowledge of the target hardware, and of course, optimization. At a high level, as mentioned, the engine was developed in 100% assembly language as step one. Anything less would have had a notable performance impact. Linden's Quake renderer would essentially work by transforming polygons into a list of edges sorted by reciprocal Z. So the edges that are closest to the camera would become active. And then he would render individual spans for that particular edge. And then he would trace out each polygon per scan line. Pretty simple and effective. But going deeper, Linden took advantage of some hardware tricks of the GBA to squeeze every last drop of performance from the hardware. Linden was also learning about the GBA as he was developing his engine for it at the same time, documenting CPU instructions and their timings. The GBA uses a 32-bit ARM processor that clocks at 16.78 MHz, but its memory distribution and architecture is what makes the hardware so unique and in the right hands so powerful. Nintendo would offer both a 16 and 32-bit bus depending on where data would be stored and its memory architecture would compose of 32 kilobytes of internal work RAM known as IW RAM. This RAM was the fastest and it was the part of the AGB SOC chip with a 32-bit bus. Linden's approach to Quake was similar to Doom on the SNES. He would use DMA or direct memory access to copy large blocks of code directly from the ROM to IW RAM and execute them. Of particular note would be the texture mapper, which was over 10,000 lines of assembly language code that would do much of the heavy lifting and use up most of the 32 kilobytes of IW RAM space. EW RAM was the external work RAM, and it was larger at 256K, but it comes at a cost as it sat outside the SOC, it was connected to the CPU via a 16-bit bus. This would mean additional latency in loading and storing data. However, Linden would make use of the GBA's thumb instructions. Thumb is a subset of ARM, which are encoded into 16-bit words. EWRAM is the best place for storing and retrieving thumb data, and with the correct usage, can run as fast or even faster than ARM instructions. Linden would use EWRAM to store many pre-calculated lookup tables to perform many math functions for the 3D renderer. The Game Boy Advance has no floating point numbers and Quake makes quite heavy use of them. He would also individually optimize multiplication in the code so it would use the fewest amounts of CPU cycles possible. But there's one more thing that's even faster than RAM and that's CPU register variables. When it comes to computers and game consoles, the CPU will often have a small amount of storage within the CPU itself where data can be stored and accessed very quickly. These storage cells are called registers. By default, the GBA's ARM processor has 16 registers available. However, the processor has six different modes that it can switch into with a simple assembly language instruction that can open up a total of 37 registers to the developer. These registers are also persisted. So if you switch out of one mode and return to it, the values will be retained. Linden would make clever use of these processor modes to switch and get access to the registers that he needed. I would switch to a particular mode, use the registers, and then switch to a different mode which preserved the original registers and gave me access to a new set of registers. When I switched back to the original mode, the registers were retained their values. This concept he termed bank switching was pivotal for performance. Having the values on hand in registers would always be the fastest method available. Linden would use self-modifying code to help with performance, which can reduce things like instruction branching, which can be an expensive operation and use many CPU cycles. It also helps reduce repetitive code. But self-modifying code is also quite hard to debug and maintain, as the source code may not be immediately understandable. In general, the addition of self-modifying code is a fairly complex area that requires clever programming. 
other optimizations and tricks were used to place lookup tables at the base address of ROM, IWRAM, and EWRAM, so the code did not need to first do a load operation to pull the address of this data. Incidentally, this same optimization was performed with Tomb Raider on the Game Boy Advance, which we recently covered. There is a third type of RAM that we haven't talked about, and that's VRAM. And this is obviously for graphics data. The GBA has 96 kilobytes of it, but it can also be used to store general purpose data. And Linden would use some VRAM as the hardware has so very little RAM available for the system. It was slower than IWRAM, but because it sat on the SOC, it was still faster than EWRAM. With all these concepts, Linden knew that Quake would work on the GBA, but it would not be easy. It almost took two years from inception to the ending of the final prototype, and Linden admits that this was his most ambitious project, both in terms of having to create a development system, learn the hardware, then write a full software system, very similar to Doom on the SNES project, but taken to a much higher level of complexity. But in the end, Quake on the GBA is a fascinating look at what may have been. In the right hands, the Game Boy Advance is capable of the impossible, and Randy Linden's Quake is certainly up there with some of the best impossible ports that I've ever had the pleasure to review on the channel. So there you have it, that is Quake for the Game Boy Advance, and I wanna give a huge thank you to Randy Linden for taking the time out to talk to me about this particular part of his life where he was working on the Quake project as well as letting me get access to the E1M1 demo as well and really just sitting down with me and explaining the technical aspects of the game, how it all worked, how it was all optimized to run at a solid frame rate on a lowly 16 or 17 megahertz Game Boy Advance. It's, it's quite fascinating to really hear his stories. And yeah, I just, again, want to give a huge thanks to him. But let me know what you guys think about this episode in the comments below. This has been a real fun one for me to make, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. As always, if you like this episode, don't forget to leave me a thumbs up and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.